This is Runehammer. programs. Hey, it's Hank and Bernal here. Hank and Bernal and up in Northern Runehammeria. It doesn't feel like Northern Runeham area these days because the sun is out and it's warm and that's weird. Weird warm. Hey everybody, how are you doing? Welcome back to the Piznodcast. It's your buddy here. Back once again feeling good about things. Man oh man, RPG season is upon us. You know, I say that every winter. It's like, it's time to play games all winter. And then summer comes. I'm like, oh, best things about summer is playing games. Wow. So here we are. And today's podcast, mainly uh, a little bit of mailbagging. And we got three uh, sort of dandies that I just want to pluck out of ye old mailbag. Um, you know, things worth talking about and questions that should be answered, could be answered, will be answered. And uh, we're going to talk about those, and those should include all the updates for the podcast. So, hey, welcome everybody, all the new patrons. We got two or three new patrons in the shield wall from last week. So welcome to the loony bin on that one. And thanks everybody for sticking around. Um, Ju June was uh, my biggest month yet on Patreon, so that is totally awesome. And it takes some pressure off of other projects for this project to get such support, and you know, of course, I owe that entirely to all of you guys. And, um, hey, check this out. Well, I guess that's the first mailbag question. So this mailbag question comes up just about every dang week, whether it comes up on uh, Twitter or in email. Somebody gets real curious about Junked, my new car combat game. And Junked has never made such a leap forward in its progress as in the last few days. The incomparable Matt Click Michael Barker and Nate Vanderzee from WASD20 all came over to my house Saturday and we played Junked all afternoon and not only just played it and had a great time, but thought very critically. I mean, I have four fantastic game designers. Oh, wait, I can't count myself because <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Three fantastic game designers sitting at my table working on the 
the subtleties, not just of the rules of the game, which is a big part of the design of the game, but more importantly, in my mind, how exactly you portray learning the game to a new player, what, how you word learning the game, how you, you communicate to a cold user how to jump into this world. And to me, that is just a, a huge mission and project that I've been on with my, most, my two most recent designs, which have been Junked and the Game of Skulls, which these are intended to be fast jump-in games. And so you can make the design simple, but honestly, a simple design is only the sort of the landing beach as, or the beachhead <laughs> as far as making a quickly learnable game. It's all about wording and also the sequence in which you teach a new user the concepts involved and the way those, sequence, or those concepts interlock in that sequence are what can lead to a fast early learning curve. Um, and so that's really what we worked on. So I went back to uh, the junked handbook these last few days and basically overhauled it, almost rewrote the entire thing with all that playtesting knowledge. So as far as this question, you know, what's the latest news on junked and when are we going to see it and so forth, uh, never has it leapt forward quite like this. Um, and once again, it just goes back to that, that pillar that I really believe in, which is the power of playtesting. It's just impossible to overstate how critical it is to do real person playtesting. Um, there's simply no comparison for it and no substitute, no shortcut. So all that said, we got a bunch of refinement done on Junked, a lot of improvement, a lot of sort of new rules, rules variations, rules cleanup, and then teaching cleanup. And that is all now done. I've gotten the book completely redone and reformatted also. So the PDF is also the printer ver uh, friendly version so that you don't have to have two versions there. The print and play comes with the PDF. And this is all going to be coming up on Drive-Thru RPG uh, as soon as I can get it up. So that just means I need to do a little bit of video work, a little bit of, uh, you know, promo banners and the like, and it is ready to ship. Now remember, with Junked, you do get print and play, but also, and this is a first for me, included in the PDF is a big section on exactly how I built my 3D set. So I actually did, you know, hacked up Matchbox cars, as a lot of you have probably seen in my Twitter photos. Um, and I made this entire game board that fits into a briefcase and all this stuff. And I've been waiting to really announce this until the PDF is ready. And all those how-to tips of how I built all that stuff are right in the PDF. So if you want to kind of go for it as far as building a mobile set like I did, the how-to is all there. So that's the status on Junked. You guys, it is a matter of a few days away. I'm super excited about it. Um, it's not as expansive a game as something like ICRPG, but it's a very focused game, really fun, and a lot of uh, hooting and hollering and yelling going on when you're playing Junked. <laughs> we even played an eight-car version with four players, so we each controlled two cars, um, and that leads to a crazy ending where all the Ghost Riders are coming at the cars and exploding, and holy moly, good times. So Junked is almost here, thanks for the question, and let's see, what do we have, uh, what's our next question here? Um... Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Running away. Okay. Now, this is a perennial favorite, but the, the question takes a lot of different forms. As far as this week's mailbag, the question comes in as, how do I present to my players that running away is probably the best option? My players tend to sledgehammer their way through uh, everything I present, no matter how hard it is, and they only consider retreat when one or two of them is, are the last ones standing, or most of the group has been dropped. How do I present retreat or fleeing as the best option? Well, I, I believe that this answer has many questions, but only one answer. There's many forms of this question, but only one answer. And it's a bit of a brutal one, which is you don't. You do not suggest that running away is the best option. You don't even put it in your head as the dungeon master that running away is, is cool or is good. You completely, and this is a bit of a hard standard to live up to, but it is the answer to the question, you completely let go of the potential outcomes of the situations that you propose as a dungeon master. You completely let go. You, you live in the moment as a dungeon master. You live in creating problems and situations and totally leaving the solution or outcome of those problems and situations to the players. Even to have an expectation or a hope which are very lightweight conceptual states for a dungeon master. Even to have those, that's going to influence how you're going to run, 
the encounter. It's going to influence some of the nuance and subtlety about how you describe parts and pieces of the encounter because you might be trying to hint at this desired outcome you have, which might be running away. Now, let's be brutally honest with each other. We all, as dungeon masters, love it when players are forced to flee an encounter, right? It feels very exciting. There's a lot of fear in the air. And you feel like, as a dungeon master, you finally made something difficult enough, but fair enough, that they were driven to retreat. And that's very satisfying. I cannot deny that. But if you really want to reach the highest level of being a dungeon master, you do not expect or desire flight or retreat to be the outcome of an encounter. So now there is a slightly different question being asked here, which is like, how do I make encounters challenging enough where players consider retreat maybe a little bit early? Or I see it happen more often, right? Or, or are my, another way to ask it would be, are my encounters challenging enough? That's a really good question to ask yourself as a dungeon master. Not, are the outcomes what I want? Are they hard enough? Is it hard enough to be fun? And of course, we all know that rhythm is what's gonna give you the most fun. So some encounters are easy and some are terribly hard. So that's your first rule. Your second rule, as far as are they hard enough, is if all of your heroes aren't dropping once per night, I would say everything you're doing is not hard enough. Um, and especially, you need to be getting a group to be dropped once per night. And that may not be all simultaneous, right? Because that's the most exciting type of drop. And in some games, if and some enemy situations, if everyone goes unconscious, the enemies are, you know, savage in such a way that they're just going to tear these unconscious bodies apart. That can be a wipeout. That can be a total party kill, right? But in some situations, everybody going unconscious may not mean a party kill. The enemies may be in flight. They may be out on a battlefield where, you know, moments can pass and they can recover and so on and so forth. But I would say that if you're going a night and every single member of the group doesn't drop at least once. Yes, it's way too easy. And moreover, I would expect every member to drop several times. This is why the death and recovery mechanics of a game to me are so important. Because they should be coming into play multiple times per night. And if you take 5e, for example, death saves, right? Can be a quite a lengthy process to die in 5e unless you have monsters or environmental situations that rob characters of death saves, which almost seems unfair, right? So you're gonna have a lengthy process just for a character to go through the experience of recovery sometimes. It can be up to six turns, right? That's a long time in table time. So how can you cram in two or three of those in one game? Not so easy. So if you get some cleaner death mechanics in other games, say ICRPG or even Junked in this case, you can die and recover over and over and over, almost every turn. <laughs> and it can be a great part of the excitement. And so this is why I tend to favor simpler death mechanics. A, they're more dangerous, and B, they can happen more frequently, which means the danger is really being pressed to the wall. And I think for players, that's more fun. Now, a lot of times, encounters intentionally do not have a retreat route. The door slams behind you, right? That's the oldest sort of trope of many encounters, which means you can't just leave here. Now, this can be maybe because you're running 3D terrain and it's not easy for you to rewind the group to a previously built room. This could be maybe because there's a story element that's ever forward, you know, like being chased by a skeleton army. And so you don't want characters to be rewinding because it's not very believable as they're being chased and so on and so forth. There's a lot of reasons that you wouldn't be able to retreat. But... At the very least, if you do want to see more retreat happening as a general rule, not in any given encounter, then just leave your back door open. Leave the door open that you came in as a dungeon master. There you go. That's a good way to think of it. You don't have to want them to go through that door, but you make sure to include in your description, you enter this room, the door behind you remains open, and ahead there's a locked door. Okay, right there, that in a very tight way delivers this message, which is like, if you wanna go back, you can, if you want to go forward, you're going to have some challenges. Okay, thanks. Great, I know this room. So then, you know, Blue Eyes White Dragon from Yu-Gi-Oh! pops out of a treasure chest and starts going haywire. And they remember that that door is open. They can retreat to the hallway and close the door. And they have a way out. Okay. Whereas if you climb down a crumbling slope into a dragon's lair and some of the boulders crumble off and create a sheer wall behind you. Okay, that's saying, you know, you're not going to be retreating from this. 
It's very unlikely. So the environment kind of is the definition of whether or not retreat is even an option. But I can't emphasize strongly enough, try to get it out of your mind that you want them to retreat. What you want is danger so intense that they will consider fleeing. Now that is something worth working toward. And this is uh, you know, another part of designing traps. Try not to design solutions to your traps. Experiment with just making traps that are just deadly. They're not meant to be bypassed. They're meant to kill intruders. It's that simple. Players need to come up with odd ways to solve them instead of you desiring or expecting a certain outcome. So that's what I would say. If you're not getting enough retreat, then just up your danger. And how do you do that? Well, we've talked about that a lot of times. Mainly use the environment and use things like legendary actions. Real danger is AOE. It's all players at the same time. It's save-oriented instead of your monsters making rolls. And it's environmental because the environment can't be annihilated. So Falling Rocks is the oldest, <laughs> most classic one in the book, right? You know, you can't destroy falling rocks from the ceiling. You just, you just can't. They're falling on your head. And more and more are falling on them. And whatever happens with their stats seems fair because they're giant rocks. It doesn't seem like a cheat. Where sometimes monsters, if they're too deadly, can feel like a cheat. So try to control those expectations and desires. But definitely up your challenge to the max. And, you know, if your players are barely ever retreating, that can be okay too. As long as they're dropping and they're scared. If they're indicating their fear in other ways, then they don't need to indicate their fear via retreat. Okay, now for the final piece of mail here, we got a real juicy, juicy nugget. And that, this comes from uh, Matt Shaker from the ICRPG Oathsworn group. And he is uh, looking back at some old streams that he's listening to on the YouTube, you know, he's like drinking on a Tuesday night and checking out some old streams. Notice that uh, in some of my games, there's sort of this heavy introduction. And this introduction is the opening narrative of the game and sort of sets the tone and gets the game in motion. And he found a couple real juicy ones that he really liked and asked me the question, you know, what's your sort of creative process to get these really juicy intros? So that's, that's, a, that's a nice meaty question. So first of all, the first principle of delivering a really strong intro is, you guys know my, my principle of impatience. Be impatient as a dungeon master. Being patient as a dungeon master is going to lead to boredom. But being impatient means that you want to get to the good part. And I think this is a huge thing that you can do in your intro. Wrap up what could normally be a dragged out first two hours of a D&D session and wrap it up in a 20 second intro. So this is characters meeting each other, characters finding out about a villain, characters finding out about a dilemma or a bad situation in the setting or the town that they're in. Characters finding the initial clue, deciphering it, and arriving it at their first real challenge. All this stuff. Basically, the first half of The Karate Kid, you are going to sum up in an intro. And you're going to get to the confrontation. Now, again, some might you know, criticize and say, geez, Hankerin, you're just speeding the game up so much. The players aren't the ones you know, setting this, this foundational tone. Well, that might be true, but this is my method. And there's a million methods, but my particular method, especially with something like a one-shot, is to just massively montage the whole first section and put you right in the coolest part, bang, at the end of my intro. Okay, so that's the first piece, is be impatient. You don't want to sit through slow boiling a frog to set the tone of your story and all this stuff. You're going to crunch it all the way down to like three or four sentences. Okay, next one. Usually, I'm talking about DMing from memory, right? But I really do think that the introduction of an adventure is the one time where it's pretty okay to read a pre-written paragraph to the group because that pre-written paragraph can be very carefully word-crafted to include clues, to include an impetus, a danger, an unavoidable confrontation, a terrible price, Direct personal involvement with the players, you know, these key things that make an introduction clutch and, and easy to understand. And you can word craft that sucker. You can write it up, you can ask some friends to read it over and, and see if they get the impressions that you want them to get and prepare so that you're not just winging it and you come off with this kind of anemic, maybe, uh, you know, meta style intro. Meta intros are the worst ones of all, you know, which, where you, you mention things from other games and movies and kind of you kind of meta the group into understanding your idea. That's going to be the most um, 
you know, loose or non-potent way to do a, an introduction. So I think writing down a paragraph is okay in this one case. All right, next one is what I just alluded to, which are the pieces involved in the intro. They have got to deliver more than anything else a purpose to the group. A purpose, a purpose, a purpose. Why are we here? Why are we going to ris risk our lives? Why are we going to be potentially hurting people? Why are we, you know, forced to go do all this unpleasant stuff? Why, why, why? What is our purpose? That is what your introduction is telling. It's not telling the backstory of the world. It's not telling about your cool villains that you've come up with or your cool situations or your nuanced betrayals or whatever. All that stuff is fine. But the only thing that truly matters to me is that the players come out of your introduction with an extremely clear sense of purpose and this like unavoidability. They cannot go around this obstacle. They have to go through it at even potentially the cost of their lives. If you can set that tone, then the exact nuance of the story, who's doing what and where, and what exactly the variables that are going to be involved in the very first round of turns, a lot of that stuff can be looser if they understand just like, say, the Viking Death Squad, right? Let's take them, for example. They have to find, confront, and defeat Lucifer. <laughs> Period. Or all hope is lost. The entire human race will be decimated, including them, if they cannot locate, confront, and defeat Satan himself. So they come out of cryosleep, and they have this incredibly clear, potent mission statement. we got to go find Lucifer because the other two pieces, confront and defeat him, don't even matter until they find him. And so as they come out of cryosleep, as they face various challenges, they are looking for information. They need to know where Lucifer is, and that's all they need. That's the one singular purpose they have. Now, you may say that that's a little bit railroady, but in fact, it leaves the players all kinds of room to role play and improvise in the encounters because they're not wasting cognitive load on trying to figure out why they exist. They're using all their cognitive load to say cool lines, to choose the style in which they do battle, to figure out the accent in which they talk, to figure out their relationship relative to the other players, because they're all inside of one very crystal clear purpose, to find the Lord of Darkness. Now, who, I, who am I inside of that? That's where all the freedom comes. And as a good dungeon master, there's also several ways to find out where Lucifer is because I don't need to impinge upon them one outcome. There's all kinds of ways that they can bump into this console that indicates where this huge power surge is of infernal energy. You know, it's basically a red dot with an arrow pointing to it that says Satan. <laughs> and then a blue dot that says you are here, right? <laughs> but that's really what it boils down to. And so that intro is made potent by clarity of purpose. Potent by clarity of purpose. Okay, so then the final piece about how to get these, your, your intros to your games, to really feel um, rich and lush and ready to leap into, is, and I know this may sound a little mean, but don't be too inventive. So vastly inventive or original settings or places, sort of like Numenera is a good example, or steampunk is, is awesome, a good example as well, diesel punk type stuff. It's so creative and original and quirky, it can be very hard, especially sitting down cold, you know, with your Mountain Dew and kind of, hey guys, oh, I don't even know this gamer over here. What's your name? Hey, I'm Brandon. Okay, hi, this is going to be fun, right? It can be very hard to then jump in, to get into it. Because you can't even imagine who your character is. It's so weird or inventive or original. You're just like, what am I again? Like, Numenera really has this. Now, Numenera is brilliant. I don't want to beat it up. But it's such an original and creative setting. It can be very difficult to visualize and understand your purpose in the world. And so you spend the first hour of the game just doing that while the game is unfolding. Again, the cognitive load of the player is limited. So what I suggest to solve this is to use familiar things when you're trying to get a really good intro. Use familiar things. So take Viking Death Squad, for example. Everyone knows what a Death Squad is, right? It's like these commandos that are going to go and they're probably going to die in the process. Huge, loaded piece of description right there that's just right in the title. Vikings, 
everybody knows what Vikings are. They're all getting ready to use their go forth type voice, right? They're going to have helmets. They're going to have axes. They're going to have beards. They're going to talk about, you know, their time in the north and stuff like that. All of these little tidbits come with it. And all I said was one word. And then finally, you have things like, you know, this sort of, um, you know, find and destroy Lucifer. So they know that there's going to be this sort of hellscape. They know that they're fighting on the side of good. They can, they can talk about vows and invented history that involve this situation because it's all somewhat familiar. Now, the details that unfold through the game that can be as inventive as you want. But remember, this is just the intro we're talking about. The game can be diesel punk as all hell, but the intro uses familiar concepts. You are monster hunters during the Black Plague, and a swarm of werewolves has been destroying the countryside, killing at will. No one can stop them but you. Right? Everybody knows about Van Helsing. Everybody knows what monster hunters are. Everybody knows what werewolves are. Everyone knows what the Black Plague is, what the clothes look like, what the houses look like, what the weather must be like, what their accents could be like, who the different characters are and what the histories could be. All this loaded information comes in, what did I just deliver, a two-sentence intro. Now, you don't want to do vanilla monster hunting with, with uh, werewolves, right? You want to do something inventive, and that's the fun. Your intro uses all this familiarity. The minute the adventure begins, the familiarity goes out the door and the monster hunters are equipped with all this weird diesel punk equipment. The werewolves are actually like dimensional travelers from a fungus planet that kind of look like werewolves, but it was all mistaken because of superstition of the era and all this stuff. So you see how I can instantly flip it into weirdo land. But for the sake of the intro, which is this juicy mailbag piece, for the sake of the intro, I use the familiar to draw them in quickly. Another example is Ghost Mountain. Ghost Mountain uses the Wild West combined with sort of demonology. And by using those two super familiar concepts, you do the intro to your Ghost Mountain game, right? And you keep those concepts fresh in your brain, right? You're in the desert. The sun's going down. There's a dusty road. There are horses. There are cowboys. There's a woman in a dress at a bar, right? All these things everybody knows and could put in their mind and they can just start to make interesting decisions about how they fit in because they can visualize the whole world. And then you get into, there's a demonic influence here. A large pentagram is carved on the floor of the tavern, of the saloon. And there's something strange in the air, a smell of brimstone and some of the patrons have a, a red tint to their eyes. And so you enter and you must find your brother's killer, right? So you get your purpose. You get some oddity there. You get some familiarity, which is kind of like, you know, the Omen or like Amityville or something, right? <laughs> but then you also get everything included in the Wild West. Revolvers, poker, whiskey, playing dice, donkeys, cool Mexican guys with rainbow blankets and Gatling guns, right? Sombreros, 10-gallon hats, all this stuff. A bartender cleaning a glass. All this stuff instantly pops into the player's imagination because of your utility with familiarity in your introduction. The minute the adventure starts, bang, familiarity's out the door and you get into the real juice of how strange and interesting things really are. So that's my answer how I do the introductions that I do. I write them ahead of time. I kind of throw familiarity right up in there to get it all to, to sink in. Um, and focus almost singularly on purpose. Purpose, purpose, purpose. Yeah. Okay, so that's just three big mailbags that I just wanted to answer for this week's podcast. Now, I've got some fun stuff. AtCon is in a couple of days, if you can even believe that. So I'm going to try to podcast right from AtCon. And um, we might even do a YouTube live stream. So I think I'm going to try to do cartoons, even though I'm going to be at a remote location. Because cartoons is frankly my favorite part of doing Runehammer. It's Saturday morning with you guys. And so I want to do that, even though I'm going to be down in Tacoma at AtCon. So I'll come up with something fun to do for cartoons on Saturday. And then we'll do some kind of podcast um, while I'm out there and just let you guys know what it's like to be down at AtCon. And uh, it's going to be fun. So keep an eye out on, also on runehammer.games on Facebook, which is where I'll be posting up the photos from AtCon. There's always plenty of fun photos from that. 
and we are going to be gaming. We got a huge house for like 10 of us, I think, and we're going to be gaming around the clock basically all freaking weekend. It is going to be awesome. So heading down to that. And then shortly after, just two short weeks later, it's time for Gen Con, guys. It's the main event, and it's going to be a blast. I hope everyone can get out there and meet me for a beer in the beer garden. We're going to be doing push-ups. I'm going to see some short films, maybe jump in some games. And, of course, the best part, we're going to be playing some hotel room games after hours, my favorite part of Gen Con, and just talking with friends and walking around the con, buying dice and looking at games that are coming up next year. So... Let's look forward to all that stuff. That's going to be great. And then con season for me will be on a little bit of a break and be back to normal for a while um, as life goes on. So watch for Junked probably next week on Drive Through RPG. Junked is going to be released. I'm really looking forward to it. And um, maybe the immortal patrons uh, here on the Runehammer podcast can look forward to a free copy of Junked in their mailbox coming up next week, so there's a little something-something. Anyways, you guys, hey, it's been great looking at the mailbag. Always really fun thinking about these heavy-duty topics and not only answering the questions, but diving deeper into the thinking beneath the questions and the answers with all of you guys standing by my side, pressing forward into a world of better RPG play. Just like this weekend, just like tomorrow night, just like the night after that, and the night after that, and the night after that, we're going to play some RPG. We're going to sit with friends. We're going to do bad accents. We're going to call each other names. And we're going to roll dice. And that's how it's going to go down up in the Runham area. You guys, this is Hanker and Burn all signing off. I'll see you all on the internet. This was Runehammer. RPG Mainframe, episode 26. Strength, honor, and beer, beer, beer. Thank you.